Hi. What just happened? For you. If you had to describe the last 18 months, what words or phrases would come to your mind? I made a list of my own words and I asked some friends and some other presenters for this meeting for theirs. And there were so many and they carry so much emotional weight. These words represent the pandemic, of course, but also lots of other things. Politics, race, police brutality, gun violence, climate change. Most of all, our personal experiences from depression and fear and anger to a renewed sense of connection to our sourdough cultures, if nothing else. This has been a challenging time. Let's not mince words. It has been awful. I bet everyone here has lost someone dear to them in this year and a half, maybe from COVID, maybe from health problems that COVID made it hard to get treatment for, maybe from violence or isolation or other reasons. If you haven't been affected by the loss of life, other losses have hurt as well. Many of us in our community have been infected with COVID and survived, and that's great. But now we're finding new limitations and new scary realities that are unknown territory. We don't know if these things are permanent or how long they might last. We don't have any specialists we can refer to. Long COVID is a quality of life threatening situation, and we don't know anything about it yet. And frankly, our healthcare system is not in a position to be very helpful. I know people who are dealing with debilitating fatigue, career-threatening brain fog, intermittent peripheral neuropathy, symptoms of PTSD, and lots more. How do you run a school? How do you run a classroom? How do you run a continuing education business or a massage practice with these kinds of challenges? And there are other losses too. What else have you grieved for this year? Lost chances to celebrate milestones, birthdays, graduations, lost opportunities to hug parents and children and grandchildren, lost opportunities to mourn in connection with others, lost communities lost relationships. It's appropriate to take some moments to think and feel about these last 18 months. It is okay to not be okay for a bit. So let's give it just a minute to feel some feels and take some breaths and recognize what we have been through. I am not, you will be happy to know, going to talk for an hour about what a nightmare this time has been, and it hasn't all been a nightmare. And if you watched, you saw some words in our mix that spoke of connection and recharging and hope. We're really good at that, aren't we? I've been working on this speech for a long time. I started making notes and writing things down and trying to organize my thoughts starting on the day I took on this commitment. I have worked on this speech from my desk 
in the midst of doing webinars and writing articles and writing blogs and working on CE classes. And yeah, I didn't get very far. It's so much easier to put out the fires that are right in front of us than it is to get ahead of the deadlines that lie somewhere out there in the future, isn't it? I worked on this speech from my beach, just trying to record some stream of consciousness while I walk the dog and watch for seals and try not to step on jellyfish. And I still couldn't find the threads I was looking for. I filled pages of notebooks from my deck, enjoying some spring sunshine, trying to find the outline of my thoughts. I love a good outline, but how do you put an outline on what we have all just been through? And I wrote most of these words that I am sharing with you at this moment when I was in Puembo, which is a suburb of Quito in Ecuador, the day before I returned to the States after a two week vacation. My hotel has a big bird garden with reflective glass. So these eared doves and saffron finches and these blue gray tanagers, they couldn't see me. And as I wrote this, I am immersed in the trills of rufous collared sparrows and the chittering noises of sparkling violet eared hummingbirds. Our airline schedule required that we spend an extra day here. What a hardship. So I set aside this as a time to really lean in hard to work on this speech because we all know how that works, right? You set aside a time specifically for writing something that's going to be really hard and delicate and careful. And the muse will always hit you right then exactly when you need it. Works like a charm. I will confess, I did not spend a lot of other time working on this speech during my vacation. I was busy communing with great sapphire wing hummingbirds and giant tortoises and marine iguanas and sea lions and blue footed boobies and blue footed booby babies. But truthfully, this speech was never that far from my mind. And what I gained from this time away from my computer is a sense of perspective that I could not begin to achieve close to home. So here's where I landed. The title of my speech is what just happened? Massage therapy on the threshold. Threshold of what? I keep asking myself, when have we not been on a threshold? What a stupid title. Whose stupid idea was this anyway? Somehow I agreed to try to encapsulate what this time has meant for our community in the context of the history of our profession. <laughs> but I can't tell you what has just happened in your life and why would you want me to? And I could tell you all kinds of things that happened in my personal life over the last year and a half, but why would that be interesting and how could it possibly be useful. But what I can do is step back and offer the perspective that I have as a certified geezer in our profession to share a little bit of eyewitness history about what I've seen, where we've been, my views on 2020 to 2021, and how that has brought us here as a profession. And what I hope will happen next. And in that process, I want to invite you to take your opportunity to reflect on your lived experience, your history in this profession, what's brought you to this moment in your life, and what you think and hope will happen next. The theme of this meeting is promoting ideas and strategies in the evolving world of massage therapy education. So I went to these how to write a great keynote speech websites to try to 
figure out how to do this. And I learned that part of my job here is to set up the theme. So our meeting is more cohesive and more useful to all of us. And I love this theme. Evolving is where it's at, right? And at last, at last, I have found a shape for my thoughts. Because I just got back from Galapagos, where this cactus evolved to grow in really young lava. And these land iguanas evolved to learn how to swim and eat seaweed and excrete salt. And these prickly pear cactuses evolved to grow trunks so that the tortoises wouldn't eat their tender little cactus pads. And then the tortoises grew and they grew these saddle shaped shells and long necks so they could reach the prickly pears anyway. In Galapagos, these cormorants found out they don't need these huge wings, so they stopped growing them. And now they hunt just by moving through the water. And the finches evolved to be able to eat just about anything. And they developed beaks for their specialties, from bugs to soft seeds to hard seeds to, and I am not making this up, the blood of Nazca boobies. Seriously, vampire finches are a thing. What do we learn here? Evolution is where it's at. And if ever the profession of massage therapy education has needed to evolve quickly, it has been in this bizarre, scary, challenging time out of time. I am privileged to be familiar with the presenters and the topics that lie before us today and tomorrow for two reasons. One is that I served on the planning committee and I got to review their proposals. And the other is that I got to interview most of them for short promotional videos. So I got a little preview of what is to come. And so I can say with confidence that this meeting will address the topics of our evolving world in massage therapy education with great energy. And anyone involved in our field from administration to classroom teachers to continuing education providers will find ideas and strategies here that will make us stronger and nimbler and better able to evolve successfully so we can serve our stakeholders better than ever before. But to do that, to improve, to grow, to evolve, we must have a clear vision of where we have been. As I work on this speech, we are in the middle of big controversy right now about how to teach American history and whether including age appropriate but realistic descriptions of the experiences of people of color in the history of this country is proper. This controversy is mind boggling to me. We have just been through and continue to live through a period of realization about what it means to be a person in this country who is not white and it rivals anything we have seen since the civil rights era. And it is a rude awakening to be sure to anyone who thought that because we elected a black president, we had officially entered a post-racial era. So we were done with all that. Today, we see the consequences of social injustice all around us. And we have exciting, compelling, moving voices of people of color who are eager to share their stories, to share their histories, which are in fact our histories, our stories, because we all live in a culture that the experiences of people of color have helped to form. And some politicians in power want to shut that down because it might 
be divisive. Mm. Because evidently, what we're doing now is not divisive. Now, I know that I run the risk of going off the rails here a little bit, but this is important to me. And it's completely relevant to massage therapy education because one of the things that became clearer than ever before for me this year is the existence of systemic racism, not only in healthcare, but in the ways that we, that I have traditionally taught about health and wellness and disease. From the dearth of pictures of skin conditions in people of color to the ways that things, issues like heart disease, diabetes, renal failure, even traumatic brain injury in football players are discussed and treated differently in white people compared to people who are black and brown, I am as guilty as any in my blindness about my perspectives on these issues as a teacher. And now I am working to change that. Because as we learn from Maya Angelou, we do our very best. And then when we know better, we do better. My point, and really there is one buried in here somewhere, <laughs> is that we cannot get to an accurate perspective on our present without taking a clear-eyed, unsentimental look at our past. Are we noticing how few teachers of color exist in the massage therapy education profession right now? Where did that come from? Are we noticing the continued conflation of massage therapy and sex work or that massage is still linked closely with human trafficking, where did that come from? Are we noticing that we still struggle to staff our classrooms with teachers who have the skills they need to meet the needs of our students? That while we have some widely accepted educational standards, many classrooms don't use them that we can't be part of integrative healthcare until we learn what other healthcare providers do and where our work fits to create better outcomes for people who need it. I hope we're starting to notice these things and a lot more because it is long past due. And here's a little bit of foreshadowing. Many of these challenges that I just named are going to be addressed by our presentations this weekend. So, Buckle up, because we are in for a ride. I can't answer all those where did that come from questions, but I can share some of my way back when I was in massage school perspectives that might help fill in some of the pieces of how our profession got to where it is today. And I am going to offer this to you, but it has to come with the understanding that it all comes through my own personal filter, my biases, and most of all, my blind spots. And among those blind spots are these. I am not an academician. My formal education, as I am constantly telling people, stopped with my bachelor's degree in theater so my perspectives are not born of a university advanced degree setting. I came to the world of credible research through my work with the Massage Therapy Foundation and the very, very patient tutelage of people who know much more about massage therapy research than I do. Also, I am not familiar with most non-Western styles of bodywork or with the traditions, conventions, and explanations that accompany them. So I tend to leave them out of most of my discussions of bodywork options because I'm not knowledgeable about them. Sometimes that limitation means I have a narrow point of view and I leave out important things and I'm working on it. Finally, and this is really important, I am firmly a product of my time. My mother was the first woman in her family to work outside the home. And my root culture 
carries some of her notions of identity and gender roles that I hope are kind of weird and antiquated to many of us now. But they helped to shape the person I became and my expectations of what my career could be or should be. And they are part of the lived experience of lots of people in my generation. So with these limitations and filters in mind from my own experience, here is a point of view about where we came from. I started massage school in late 1984 because I didn't see a future in the theater community and I didn't want to be a public school teacher and I didn't want to work in restaurants and I really didn't want to work with computers. I went to massage school because all the other things I thought I might want to do, I didn't want to do. And that is probably not so different from the stories of many of the people who find their way into our classrooms. I enrolled and I got really excited about it. And I remember calling my mom and I enthusiastically told her, guess what? I figured it out. I'm going to be a massage therapist. And her less than enthusiastic response was, you're going to be a what? I started massage school in October of 1984 and I completed it in April of 1985. I had 125 hours of education on my first transcript. And at that time, I was going to one of the very best schools in the state. I started massage school when it cost $350 and about $100 for books if you didn't buy Travel because we were advised to ask for the Travel books for Christmas. None of our books were written for massage therapists because these things didn't exist. We met twice a week in various locations and one weekend a month we had a day-long class with a potluck lunch. I started massage school with a homemade table. It weighed 50 pounds and it didn't have a face hole or a cradle. It was, way, it was made of three-quarter inch plywood and a piano hinge and it cost me $25 and five massages and this piece of furniture is so stable and so sturdy that it is still an important item in my household today. It is my sewing table. I started massage school in a state with no education requirements, although we did at least have a massage license and a pretty rigorous testing process. The licensing exam came in two parts. There was a written exam where you took your number two pencil to fill in the bubbles and a practical exam where you show up with a physically perfect specimen because God help you if your model has any cuts or bruises or scars and you took them to, I am not making this up, a motel by the airport. And then two or three examiners would have you demonstrate two muscles, their attachments, their shortened and lengthened positions, their resistive gymnastics. And then they would ask you to do Swedish massage on some random part of the body that they would choose. The front of the leg, the back of the leg, the arm, the back, or heaven forbid, the abdomen. And they would hover over you with their clipboards completely expressionless, writing, writing, watching, watching. And they for, do, would do this for hundreds of applicants over the course of a couple of weeks, twice a year. And they'd have to sleep in those motel rooms. God bless those examiners because what a crappy job. I started massage school in a one teacher program and our class was big and some people joined late and they were having a hard time getting caught up. And so I was recruited to help tutor them. And in this way, I became a massage teacher before I even graduated from massage school. And I just sort of never stopped. As the school grew, I took on more teaching responsibilities and I give a lot of credit to my boss who was an excellent teacher and a great teacher trainer and a world-class outliner. 
His model of incorporating anatomy and physiology and kinesiology and hands-on practice has informed the way that I have worked ever since. So thanks, Brian. I started massage school when our target market for consumers was basically healthy people who had a little extra money and who wanted massage to feel good and to stay healthy. So I started my massage practice with almost no information about working with people who live with ongoing diseases or conditions or other kinds of health challenges. And because I thought I would be building my practice by working with my actor friends, and because <laughs> actors have no money, I ended up working mostly with my friends' parents who did have a little disposable income. So for a few years, I did mostly home visits with clients who were probably younger than I am now, but they seemed old to me then. And they had diabetes and knee surgery. And in those days, it was open surgery. They would lay open that joint capsule like a book and poke around in there to pick out little bits of stray cartilage and then stitch it all back up again. And these people had hip replacements and they had osteoporosis and they had all kinds of other ailments. And I was unprepared to be helpful to them. And that prompted me to get more invested in learning about pathology. And ultimately it led to my book and an amazing career. And that is not my story for today. In those days, the early eighties, most states were not regulated and or they didn't have any massage education requirement in the city where I lived, which was progressive. If I had wanted to open a practice location when I graduated, it would have had to be on the same block with the triple X movie theaters and the dirty bookstores, because in that year in my part of the city, that's how massage businesses were zoned. It was only through the efforts of schools and volunteers working with the state board that we evolved, that we managed to create legislation that made it illegal to use the word massage in any kind of advertising unless the person had a state license. That helped with the zoning issues. Did it fix the problem? No, but it was a giant step in the right direction. In 1992, or it might have been 93, I took the pilot NCB TMB exam. Again, with the number two pencils, and we'll give you your results in six weeks. My colleagues and I, we were delighted to see this happen because we assumed it meant we were all on the road to both raising the standard for massage education and also moving towards some kind of national consistency in education and portability and licensing. And won't that be great? And that was <laughs> um, 28 years ago. Soon after I was nationally certified in therapeutic massage and body work, we moved to another state an unlicensed state. And I was informed that I could open a practice there, but first I would have to prove that I didn't have a sexually transmitted infection, venereal disease, they called it. I took a pass and instead I took some time away from practice to become an at-home mom for my two young children. And this was also the time when I was asked to write a document based on contraindications for the school that I had left. Now this was before most people had the internet, so my resources were limited to the AMA Family Medical Guide and a handful of college level AMP and pathology books that were way too hard for me and the public library. Well, that project eventually became a book proposal and that was my entry into the world of publishing in massage therapy education. And five years later, mine was the first massage specific book that Williams and Wilkins ever produced. And it joined the market with just a tiny handful of other professionally published massage therapy specific books. I opened my first box of books 
at the 1998 AMTA convention in Washington, D.C. And what a surprise. It turns out that massage therapists were starving for books written for them. The publishers were in heaven. Acquisitions editors scoured national meetings looking for anyone who had good ideas who could write in complete sentences and hit a deadline. The late 90s and the early 2000s were halcyon days in massage therapy education if you weren't a proprietary school. Because big businesses and career schools and community colleges and lots of others noticed the increasing interest in this profession. And this led to a lot of shall we call them haphazard programs, along with some gems that have persisted and still set a wonderful standard in massage therapy education. Federal student loans made it possible for almost anyone to get into massage school, and that was great because it broke down some really hard financial barriers, and it was problematic because it created a situation where it became more expensive to go to massage school because you needed someone to run the financial aid aspect of it. It also created a situation where people who were not a great fit for massage school found themselves enrolled. So schools had to dedicate staff to manage financial aid at the expense of things like recruitment and student services and curriculum development and faculty. And economies of scale made it harder and harder and harder for small, individually owned proprietary schools to survive. And many of them didn't. But some did. And then the financial crisis of 2008 happened, and lots of people kind of stopped getting massages for a while. And we felt those reverberations through the entire industry, from the franchises to the clinics to the sole providers. And it got really hard. Eventually, many of the corporate and career schools closed, as much because of new scrutiny about student loan practices as because of low enrollment. Many of the community college programs decided not to offer massage therapy training anymore. But you know who hung on? A lot of those small sole proprietor programs that were able to stay open by virtue of being nimble and imaginative and resilient and they evolved and things finally stabilized. There had been a big bubble in massage therapy schools and the bubble burst and the remaining businesses finally began to stabilize. And so there we were in say 2015 to 2019 and it looked like things were finally beginning to turn the corner. Massage therapy was in a growth period in some settings like hospitals and other healthcare facilities and a ton of massage therapy research was being published and the franchises and spas were growing and some of them had begun to realize that raising wages and benefits was a good investment to keep their best therapists happy and some single owner schools were really thriving and expanding to multiple campuses and to my eyes Things were looking good. In early February of 2020, at an event in Seattle, I taught my public health issues class, which is called Herpes, Hep, and Flu, Oh My. And I often reserve time at the end of that class to take a peek at whatever new infectious diseases looked like they might require some attention. So I did that when we had a handful of Ebola cases in the United States, and I did that when Zika virus was in the news. And for this meeting in February of 2020, I did make a few slides on what we knew about this brand new thing that was being called 2019-NCOV. And I dug through my old records and I found these slides and I will share them with you now with the caveat that this is all based on the information that was made available to the public at the end of January 2020, which may or may not have been accurate. At that time, all we knew was that this was a novel virus. It had not been seen in humans before. And as of January 30th, 
there had been a total of 13,000 suspected and confirmed infections and 170 reported deaths. And this was mostly happening in China, but 82 infections had been found outside China in 18 different countries. It turns out that the virus was here in the United States at that time, but we didn't know it yet. At that time, in February 2020, we thought the main route of infection was from animals to people, but some human-to-human -human transfer had been observed. We didn't know the incubation period, but we did know that the infection had a profound effect on both the respiratory and urinary systems with a significant risk of death. For treatment options, we looked mainly to prevention because we didn't have anything else. And prevention meant putting a high priority on wide accessibility of really accurate testing. And as we know, that did not work out well. We were also recommended to use an N95 respirator mask, but really only if we planned to travel to China. And when it came to massage, well, in my opinion, we just didn't have enough information to make any good decisions. Shortly after that class, while I was on what turned out to be my last trip of the before times, Joe Bob Smith, who you will hear speak this weekend, asked me to prepare a few bullet points to act as some guidelines for his schools about dealing with the threat of this infection. And I did. I wrote something that I published that it was intended to be supportive and helpful and non-alarmist with some gentle suggestions about upping our hygiene game and keeping an eye on the news, but nothing terribly alarming beyond that. A few days later, shortly before the national lockdown, I published another blog titled, I was wrong, shut it all down. And oh my goodness, the hit the fan. I got a zillion, it's just the flu messages. And I got videos about using a hairdryer in your nose and your mouth to kill the virus. And I lost count of how many people sent me links to Plandemic. At one point, I was called a pedophile for giving advice about hygiene. Not sure where that conclusion came from. And I made a very incendiary statement that while massage therapy is important, I did not consider us to be essential workers who should be competing for personal protective equipment with other providers who needed it. And I took a lot of hate for that at the time, but given the fact that we had hospital staff who were wearing garbage bags and reusing disposable masks because they couldn't access the equipment they needed to stay safe, I will stand by that point of view. At the same time, I got a lot of appreciation from people who were just looking for some guidance, any guidance that seemed to make some sense. And that was great. And it definitely, it helped me to be willing to stay in the game. But I said it then, and I'll say it today. My advice is just that. It's just my little advice. It's not a rule. Any advice or recommendation that I ever make is as informed and as useful and as defensible as I know how to make it. And I'm happy to change it when that becomes necessary, if I am shown to become wrong. For me, 2020 was the year when learning to tell the difference between reliable information and misinformation, which is unintentionally inaccurate, and disinformation, which is intentionally inaccurate and manipulative, telling the differences between these things became a critical skill. It doesn't help that reliable information changes over time. That's what always happens in science. But we saw it in this last year in super fast motion, didn't we? And so for people who are anxious and frightened and feeling threatened and needing something solid and unchanging to hold on to, seeing those public health statements change and change quickly made those statements seem untrustworthy. And that 
is completely understandable. And there were other forces at work here that really interfered with communications in those early scary days. The CDC was hamstrung. They were badly compromised by the administration. The World Health Organization was defamed. These treatments, hydroxychloroquine, a treatment with no demonstrated benefits for COVID prevention or treatment, was promoted to the extent that the people who needed it, the people with serious autoimmune diseases, couldn't get it. To say nothing of a variety of other kinds of questionable guidance we were given from people who should have known better. In our communities, we looked for some direction from our health departments, from our state licensing boards, from our membership organizations who could only tell us to follow our local laws. We were looking for directions about how or if to open safely and we were disappointed. No one was willing to say, this is safe or that's not safe. And there's a really good reason for that. Nobody knew. And when we finally did publish some reopening guidelines, and I was on the task force that worked on this with the Federation of State Massage Therapy Boards, those guidelines were based on the understanding that COVID was mainly spread through droplet transmission and contaminated surfaces. And this image is kind of a joke, but you know what? It's not that far off from what we thought might be necessary. Now we have learned better since then about airborne transmission. So we're no longer, you know, isolating our mail or washing our groceries or changing our shoes every time we come into a new space. But you know what? I'm fine that this made massage therapists pay more attention to surface care and hand care and air quality. And those are some changes that I hope will follow us into the future for sure. It has been my great honor and privilege to be considered a a dependable resource for practical information during this difficult time. And I take that responsibility very seriously. And I receive a lot of appreciation for my work for which I in turn am deeply appreciative. I have had a lot of help and support from other massage therapists. I hope you know who you are as well as a variety of maybe less enthusiastic healthcare providers who I sometimes have to pin down and quiz about issues like coagulopathy or airborne transmission or (laughs) my next big project, what long COVID really is and where massage therapy might help. So that was my year and my last 35 years and what happened to me all in a nutshell. On the personal side, I will share, I had my own sourdough successes and failures, but you know what? I got pretty good at cream puffs. Where are we now? We've just taken a hit, a real gut punch. How many schools do you know that closed this year for good? How many massage therapists closed up shop and decided never to reopen? How much institutional wisdom has been taken from us, along with the other casualties of COVID? According to the ABMP's recent survey of schools, in 2018, we graduated 23,887 students from 965 schools. In 2020, we graduated 20,598 students from 919 programs. 50 schools shut down in that interim period. That said, their data show some really interesting resilience in the massage therapy education field. We lost 50 programs between 2018 and 2020. But we lost 176 programs between 2014 and 2016. If anything, the downward trend in the number of programs in our field is flattening. And this makes me wonder if we might even have seen a turnaround in this period if it hadn't been for the pandemic. With the closing of schools and the reduction in the number of students, 
Our opportunities to follow our calling in massage therapy education have become scarcer. I am hopeful to see that number turn around too. I anticipate it may take a while. How much more important is it now to make sure that massage therapy teachers are highly educated and ready to take on the new challenges that lie before us? We have moved on, evolved, you might say, from the teaching model we lived in when I was in massage school, the sage on the stage. The guide on the side came next, especially in technique classes. That works well, but where are we now? We're at the classroom on Zoom with caffeine on the screen. And that's a joke, of course. I have had really a lot of fun this year exploring new avenues in distance learning. And I don't think that's going to go away anytime soon. We've all had to learn some new skills and climb some steep learning curves in a short time, but really that just makes us more versatile. What comes next? What do you think comes next? What do you hope comes next? Because we know those two things are not the same. Let's just take a moment to reflect on that question. The Alliance for Massage Therapy Education plans to have an in-person meeting next summer in Austin, and we will be so happy to be together in real space, and it will be so very, very noisy. And can I just say I am really looking forward to the keynote speech for that event. But I invite us all to just take a moment now to shoot forward a year in time what will your life in massage therapy education look like in July 2022? What kind of work do you want to be doing? How will it compare to what you were doing two years ago? Will it be work that sustains you? Are there things you can be doing now, learning now, taking action on now that will improve your own future in this profession and in this community? And what can we be doing communally all together to strengthen our profession? I feel like my time in massage therapy has been just a heartbeat. The AMTA, founded in 1943, predates me, but truthfully, not that many other things do. I have seen in that heartbeat of time the establishment of the National Certifying Board for Therapeutic Massage and Body Work. And I helped in the early content creation for this question bank. I saw the creation of the Association for Body Work and Movement Professionals and the Commission on Massage School Accreditation and the beginning of the AMTA Foundation and its recreation as the Massage Therapy Foundation. I attended the Foundation's very first research meeting where I learned that people who are interested in health, even those outside the massage therapy profession, are watching us and they are very interested in our work. I saw how Title IV funding and student loans expanded the range of who could go to massage school. And I remember hearing about this nutty idea of franchises for massage. Pfft, we all knew that was going to go nowhere. I watched the beginnings of the Federation of State Massage Therapy Boards and its establishment of the Massage Board Licensing Exam, and I helped to set some difficulty standards for early iterations of that exam. I watched nervously as some really smart people outlined a very ambitious Massage Therapy Body of Knowledge document. And while I was president of the Massage Therapy Foundation, I got to see how the Massage Therapy Body of Knowledge informed another educational keystone, the Entry Level Analysis Project. And I remember early conversations with Pete Wittridge about the creation of yet another organization, this one dedicated to supporting educators. That's a crazy idea. And then I saw the Alliance publish the core competencies and the teacher education standards project, the first thing of its kind in our history. 
And a few years ago, I had the honor of serving on the committee that developed the Certified Massage and Bodywork Educator Program. Over the years of their existence, every one of these organizations has evolved with the profession. Sometimes that evolution was toward growth and expansion, like when all the publishers were desperate for new authors. Sometimes that evolution has had to adapt to contraction, like when all the publishers dropped their massage titles and the corporate schools closed and the pandemic led hundreds of our wisest and most experienced educators and practitioners to pack it all in. Evolution is natural, but it's not always pretty, is it? There are people in this field who have been here longer than I, whose institutional knowledge reaches back further and wider, whose lived experience is far richer than mine. And I would never want to suggest that my perspective is the truth, regardless of this silly picture taken at an AFMTE meeting many years ago. You'd get a very different point of view about our profession's place in history and its present and its future from anyone else, from Sandy Fritz or Benny Vaughn or Nancy Dale or Patricia Benjamin or David Lauderstein or Judy Calvert. That's a list that could go on for days. And a really different perspective from the giants who have left us. Jack Marr, Bob King, Mark Beck, Leon Chetow, Elaine Kalenda, so many others. Like all of us, I have evolved to get here. And sometimes I'm embarrassed to have the status that I've been able to achieve in this profession because of my privilege. I work hard for sure. But the biggest external hurdle I ever had to face to reach my level of success in this field was a mother who was confused and concerned for my well-being. You're gonna be a what? But from that moment forward, I got to be a white woman with an excellent education and a level of some kind of financial stability that made it possible for me to write a book and to volunteer on committees and to choose to do only work that makes me happy. And there are people in this field, there are people here today who faced huge obstacles to be here. Obstacles based on gender and sex and race and ethnicity. You ask Benny Vaughn what it was like to be a black male massage therapist in the South in the 1970s. Obstacles in the form of financial status and educations that didn't prepare us well. And you know what, you guys, you did it anyway. And you, I hope, have a really different view of what just happened and where our profession is now and where it should go next. And your opinion on that is important. Whatever happens next, I want our profession to reflect our highest values of equity and quality, not because it's nice and not even just because it's moral, but because (laughs) it's good for us. It's good for all of us. We are all made stronger and richer and more deeply rooted in our true history and therefore more able to reach for our best future when every single person who feels called to practice massage or teach massage or volunteer in the profession or serve in leadership roles feels valued and valuable. What just happened. My perspective, my truth is not your truth, but our truths put together can help us choose a path forward to for us that is imbued with wisdom and strength and guided by compassion and realism and commitment to excellence. In this last 18 months, we've had a lot of changes forced on us. Some of those changes have been great, and I hope we can use the good ones as we move forward. (laughs) Changes like remote learning, when its benefits outweigh its deficits. Changes like being more conscientious about looking for who's missing from our community. And then creating spaces that celebrate diversity, diversity of race, yes, 
diversity of age, diversity of gender, of body size, of neurodivergence, and all the other aspects of humanity that make us so wonderful. Changes like identifying and naming systemic racism and bigotry in the ways we recruit students and the ways we, the ways I, present information to students and the expectations we have for them when they leave us to enter their professional lives. Changes, changes like the way we have pulled together. I loved seeing how schools and teachers shared their discoveries with each other this year. It was beautiful. So what I offer today at what is hopefully near an end of what just happened and near a beginning of what happens next is an invitation to evolve with our eyes open. Let's move together toward our goals, goals like expanding our profession's diversity and building teaching school skills and using technology for the best student outcomes and instituting practical standards for massage therapy education that can be embraced by everyone who wants the best for our students. What just happened? A tragedy. An uncovering. A chance to reset, to reboot. And if we think it's over, we're fooling ourselves. We're not done. We're not done with COVID. We're definitely not done with the possibility of new infectious diseases. We're not done with racism or social justice or voting rights or equity or inclusion. We're not done with the dangers of misinformation and disinformation in massage classrooms and elsewhere. Most of all, and this is the good news, we are not done with evolving. Massage therapy began the first time someone used touch to comfort another person, and then that skill was valued and sought after. Massage therapy education began when some persons lost to history shared their skills of purposeful, soothing touch with others. We are heirs of that legacy. That history, the good and the bad, forms our past and informs our present and our future. Our evolution is inevitable. It can be random and haphazard and the result of being buffeted around by forces that are bigger and more organized than we are. But for me, successful evolution in massage therapy education looks like this. We set our standards for excellence. We build a critical mass of diverse teachers who are well prepared and excited to be in the classroom. We build curricula that reflect a solid foundation of skills and information with the benefits of cultural awareness, sensitivity, and inclusivity. We have continuing education providers who deliver evidence-informed content that is effective and helpful to their attendees, and their work is valued. And the net result will be a population of massage therapists who are confident and competent, who offer safe, effective, evidence-informed massage that makes the world a better place. And that requires that we, who are at this threshold, look, I did it, at this threshold of what comes next, that requires that we must be versatile and open-minded and watchful and welcoming and resilient. Can we do that? Can we be that? Well, when we consider all the things we have been and done over the past 35 years, to me, the answer is clear. Yes. Yes, we can do that. Yes, yes, we can be that. Thank you.